I'm Shelley, and I am here to talk about internationalization and localization. And uh, if you, so you probably all know what that is, but in case you don't, uh, it's when you want to offer your website or your app in multiple languages, so more than just English or Spanish or whatever. So um, I transitioned from PHP, I'm sorry to say, to uh, Ruby and Rails earlier this summer, and one of my first projects involved internationalization. And so throughout that process, I realized what a cumbersome and tedious task it was, and so started looking into ways to kind of streamline and simplify. So, um, let's see. So before I jump into internationalization, how many of you have actually internationalized an app? Okay, good, good. So, and uh, how many of you are planning to do internationalization in the next like few months? Awesome. <laughs> That's good. So, <clears throat> let's see. All right, so then you guys will know why more people don't internationalize. But basically, it's a huge commitment. It takes uh, a lot of time, it takes a lot of money, it's just complicated, and it's really tedious. A lot of repetitive tasks that you have to do. Um, so why should more people internationalize? Well, one of my favorite internationalization stories is uh, from BitTorrent. They, uh, two years ago, decided to internationalize and localize uh, for Russian. And it took them about six weeks. And so if you uh, look at their stats now, 50% of all of the mails in Russia use BitTorrent. So it's uh, pretty successful and really helps you get in front of a global audience. So it's worth the pain. Um, <clears throat> so the process, I break it down into kind of three phases. The first one is internationalizing, and then you localize, and then you maintain. So we'll get into that. So the first phase of internationalization if you're on Rails 3, uh, the IATN libraries are all included, so you don't have to really do anything to, to uh, set that up. Basically, it involves abstracting your content um, out of your code and into separate locale dictionaries. And then in your code, you'll replace the content with IATN placeholders, uh, and then finally set and pass the locale so that Rails knows where to uh, which locale to look up. <clears throat> so this is what your view code might look like before internationalizing. You can see all of the content is there. Uh, and this is what it looks like after. So you can see the IATN translate calls here. And this is basically your content key. So it's going to look up in the dictionary uh, for the copyright content. And you can scope it so that you can organize your, your stuff better. And you can do things like uh, variable interpolation. And um, uh, yeah, so. <clears throat> and then what happens to the content is uh, you move it into a separate file, which is called the locale file. And this goes into your config slash locales directory. And uh, you can do either YAML or Ruby files. I prefer Ruby files because they're much easier to work with. Um, so you can see you define your locale at the top, and then you've got your, you can break it out into different sections, uh, subsections, basically just a nested hash with your, your key and your content values. So here's an example of what an interpolated variable <clears throat> Shall I ask yeah. a question about the scope? Sure. Does that replace the dot notation in the key? Oh, uh, you can do it either way. So basically, um, instead of doing, you could do instead of content footer, you could do content dot footer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. I haven't seen okay. the scope option before. Oh, okay. Oh, in, in the back here, you mean? Yeah. 
Yeah. Is that the equivalent of like home scope menu is equivalent of menu.home? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so setting the locale, this is basically how you tell with your app which locale uh, to, to serve up. So, um, you will you can use a before filter in the um, application controller. So this is the what I find the easiest way to do it. Um, it's, it's just to include it in the URL. So you can do like slash en, or you can use it. You can do it subdomain with, with your en or whatever your locale code is. And then in your root file, um, just include a locale scope, and that will ensure that the locale is passed uh, with, along with your named root. So uh, a little tip, I would recommend that you start internationalizing as soon as you start building your app. And the reason is probably obvious, but <clears throat> even if you're not planning on offering multiple languages right away, it's so much easier to start and do it as you go than to like two months into it have this huge project and you've got all of these views and, and everything you need to go through and do it that way. So it's just a lot easier. Um, and if you remember back to the example, your view code looks a lot cleaner and it's a lot easier to maintain. So uh, I think it's a good idea to just get it out of the way as you go. <coughs> um, so the second phase is localizing. And basically this is where you provide lo or, uh, your translations and your locale specific formats. So localization is more than just translating from language A to language B. It's also locale appropriate date formats and, and currencies and, and you know, even images that have text in them. So here's an example of some locale details. So you've got like time and your different time formats and then uh, date time. You've got you know, about X hours. Distance, so, so things like that. Um, so what you end up doing when you localize is you create one locale file per locale that you're using in your application. So if you were doing English, Spanish, Japanese, and German, you would end up with four locale files, uh, one for each language and locale. And then uh, basically every time you add content or change content, you have to go in and add it or change it to each locale file. So you can see how this quickly starts to become unmanageable and extremely difficult to maintain. <coughs> you can find um, locale details for pretty much any locale on GitHub in the ITN project. Uh, there are a lot of Distributed locales. Um, one caveat is that they're inconsistent a lot of the time. So if you're going to use them, just make sure you go through and make sure that they're consistent with what you're what you're uh, using for your application, and and do some error checking. Um, this is one thing that after trying to muddle through a bunch of these different locale files, I decided to include in um, Word Check, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so that, so that there's some consistency there. Um, okay, so getting translations. <coughs> so you have a bunch of different options for getting translations, and you kind of start <coughs> with machine translations. Um, you can do crowdsourcing, you can get volunteers. You can have people in-house, or you can buy professional translations. Uh, from what I've seen with, with WordChuck, most people start with machine translations, and then they get uh, human volunteers from their user communities. And um, this works out pretty well uh, to at least to get you started. Professional translations can be pretty expensive. And so um, I, see, I see a lot of people that just kind of pick and choose what their most important content is and get that professionally translated. Try to fill in a lot of the rest with volunteers and then use machine translations if you have to. 